<clears throat> good morning, Brian. Good morning, Carol. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Kaylee and Carol. Thank you for agreeing to join us uh, in Are You Happy Without the Movie? Uh, it, by introduction, uh, Haley Carroll, uh, best friend for 30, easily 30 years, Carol. Uh, it, and she's the um, counselor at the Holderness School in uh, Plymouth, New Hampshire. And she's also the sexuality educator. Um, and uh, Carol's uh, highly sought after by other schools to come in and talk to the faculty uh, staff, parents, kids about human sexuality. So um, I'm so glad, Carol, that you're willing to jump into this with us. Happy Thank to. Thank you, Carol. Haley, do you have any start off questions or do you want me to? I think um, probably a good start off question is really to define how you, Carol, define human sexuality. Great. That's a good one. Um, so, human sexuality, you are born with it you die with it and so it's just it's a constant in your life um this human sexuality class that i teach at my school currently it's only a quarter of the year and it's to 10th graders and it is the only pass fail class no one has ever failed it they know yeah. that and we give effort grades so we give good fair poor um excellent so I tell every kid they have a good, you can't get less than good in my class, but you can earn an excellent. And I go on to say that this class is the most important class they'll take while at Holderness. And the reason for that is, you know, I'm like, you have to, you know, everybody has to learn who won the war of 1812 and what pi equals 3.142. But how many of you have used that today? None of you, but you have used human sexuality today by what you wore, what you, who you've connected with, how you've connected, how you're sitting, um, all those things, little language that you use. And once we can broaden human sexuality to be more than just sex, because that's what jumps out. I say to kids, okay, call home and say that, because I'm at a boarding school. They say, call home and tell your parents that you have started sex or human sexuality today. And they'll hear the word sex, and then when they hear the word sex, they'll think intercourse and they'll think you're taking an eight week class on intercourse. And I said, we'll, we'll cover intercourse, but it's not going to, it's going to be boring if that's all we talked about. And um, so they, once you broaden the sense of what human sexuality is to these kids, it's everything, right? It's everything. Um, and there's nothing more important for, for teenagers. When you say everything, like how, how, what is sort of the first thing in under the everything umbrella? Well, for me, when, you know, I work with high school kids. And so for me, it's how do you, how are you in your body, mm -hmm. for instance? Okay. Um, and all of us, I want to, maybe not all of us, I'm, I'm making an eye message. So I'm getting dressed this morning and I'm thinking, I, I, was this going to fit? Is this going to fit? Is this going to make me look fat? Is this going to, how's my hair? How's my, all of that has to do with how I feel about being in my body at this time. So for kids who are, who so want to, for teenagers who so want to fit in and others as well, but for teenagers, especially, mm -hmm. am I okay? And am I okay is a, is a human sexuality question. Um, do other people like what I look like, like what I say, like who I am? Um, are they attracted to me? So. And, and Carol, if, if you don't mind um, weighing in on this, you know that there's legislation that's probably gonna get signed in Florida and duplicated in other red states that say they, that, uh, that no mention of gender or sexuality will take place from kindergarten to third grade. Are children sexual from kindergarten through third grade? You know, I'm not an I'm not an expert, obviously, but certainly kids are, you know, you use the word sexual and people think behavior, right? right? And you're not talking behavior. You're talking feelings, right? Yep. And when I when I think about, I mean, Brian, you know, you're my guide on, you know, your story of growing up gay is, you know, 
you knew you were just different than what the mm -hmm. vast majority of boys in first grade were, were doing. Like, why were they chasing the girls? Mm -hmm. what, what was the big deal? Yeah. And, you know, I won't age you by saying, you know, Annette Funicello, but. Oh, uh, no, I, uh, yeah. I, Haley, when I was used to give college talks and you, you know, Haley grew up in Zimbabwe, uh, Carol, so she may not know who Annette Funicello is. But uh, she was a Mouseketeer, Haley, on Mickey Mouse Club. And uh, she was the prettiest. And the boys used to make a big fuss over Annette. And I'd look at Annette uh, and I think, I don't get it. I don't, I don't understand what they're so excited about. Now, I like Spin and Marty. Those are the boys on the Mickey Mouse Club. You know, but no one's mentioning them. So I better keep my mouth shut. But, uh, you know, I, so... When people say, you know, kindergarten through third grade, they're innocent. And then, Carol, part of the legislation, and it's all part of our, our storyline here, is then henceforth it will be age appropriate. Well, who determines what's age appropriate? The teacher, the parent, school board, you know, right. the governor. And, and when you, you know, we're not, for me, you know, as a lesbian mom, it was really important for me to make sure that my daughter, when she was in school, she's 30 now, Haley, um, when she was in school, that she was in a school that where she wasn't going to hear negative put downs that at least weren't weren't um, addressed. So, you know, somebody said, why don't you send her to St. Mark's or whatever? And I'm like, I don't think so. Um, but I, so you, you find a school that is welcoming for the daughter of a of a gay woman. And so it's not about her sexuality, but it's about her love for me. And I want her to be comfortable in school. Why should she be uncomfortable in school? Because she has a gay mom, right? But that's what the legislation I'm afraid in Florida is going to do to these families, right? Like, why can't you go in and be proud of the fact you have two moms or two dads? Can we, sorry, go back to some of the basics here in terms of human sexuality and trying to understand that from sort of a basic perspective. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> in your definition, human sexuality is everything that we are. What's the difference between human sexuality and psychology or biology? That's a great question, Haley, and I don't know if I can, can give it a, a, a solid answer, but what I would say is those are incorporated, the psychology and the biology are, are all incorporated. Um, you know, I'm just, I'm looking at our faces here on the screen and I'm thinking it's all, it's all connected, right? Mm -hmm. But for us to remove, remove human sexuality would be to, for us to remove psychology, I think. I mean, that's sort of how I feel on that. Right. Right. What's, what's your sense? I, well, I think there's a, a real tight link between human sexuality, the soul, the spirituality. Uh, I, I see human sexuality as our, our identity. Um, and, our, and, and while our identity is arbitrary uh, and can be culturally uh, um, influenced, uh, it nevertheless is the car that we drive through much of our life. And uh, so when I talk about human sexuality, as Carol said, I'm talking about body image. I'm talking about one sense of attraction, uh, a, a, a one sense of what is masculinity and what is femininity and do I fit neatly in either one or do I have both? And if I have both, what does that make me? You know, I, I, I one time went to my dad and uh, because one of my uh, nipples uh, had, uh, Carol, Carol, I think you call it a button. What is it that when it gets hard and there, it, my, I thought I was becoming a woman. I mean, mm -hmm. who knew? You know, we don't have anyone talking to us about it, especially in Catholic schools, Catholic churches. So he said, no, no, I don't think he'd ever seen it before and it's gone away. But he said, no, no, you're a boy, that's natural. That's all human sexuality. You know, my having pictures of wrestlers all around my bedroom is human sexuality. I didn't want to have sex with any of them because I didn't know what sex was. You know, we all thought blowjob was blowing, right? Yeah. So, uh, 
I didn't know what it was. And when kids made reference to it, I didn't know what they meant. But, but I you laughed, but you laughed because they oh, were laughing. To, oh, you had to yeah. laugh. Yeah. yeah. Um, because if you didn't laugh, they would think, well, you don't get it. Or what are you, queer? Mm -hmm. And of course, that was the worst thing you could possibly be asked. So uh, so it's it's attraction. It's my sense of what is masculine. You know, it, uh, Kate, Haley, one of the things I had to ask myself was, you know, am I a man? Not just because of the nipple thing, but, you know, Oliver North, uh, who is a kind of a disgraced uh, American military person, said, um, if, if they uh, allow gay people in the military, no real man will ever enlist again. So the line in the sand was how you, you had to be heterosexual to be real man. And so, did, you know, did that mean that I wasn't a real man? And if I wasn't, what was I? Because I knew I wasn't a woman. And so human sexuality for me includes this long journey of, of dealing with um, not just who am I attracted to, how do I feel about my body and my masculinity, but also how do I deal with the fact that it's really hard for me to have sex now at 74? You know, my body's betraying me in some ways uh, because of the meds I have to take. You know, I talked to a, a lot of older gay men deal with erectile dysfunction, which no one wants to talk about because they think it's embarrassing uh, that they haven't gotten any in a long time. So, this, does that, Haley, if you look at the um, definition of human sexuality that Sex Information and Education Council uh, has, it's several, several lines of all the components mm -hmm. of human sexuality. Uh, you know, right, and I think it's so important that we're having this conversation because it's incredibly confusing and complex. So it, really it is. So trying, you know, for anybody that's watching this to really try and answer that question what is human sexuality and i'm well aware that you know many different people are going to have different opinions and different perspectives but i think it's important for us in this conversation today to just really sort of baseline okay when we're speaking about human sexuality this is what we're talking about and keeping mm -hmm. it sort of in that context so for me and even though i've heard yours your definition carol and yours brian I'm still confused as to what we're talking about today when we speak of human sexuality. Haley, Are we speaking what, what, about everything that is the body, mm -hmm. which would be psychology, biology, chemistry, physics, spirituality, or are we focusing on the attraction, what happens when inside that body, when that attraction is felt? And how that then simulates the sexual organs and what happens in the body when that is sort of kicked off. I feel like that's a, a, a part of it, okay. but it's a small part. You could, you could, you're, a, you have human sexuality. You, you are a human sexual being and you don't ever have to have a turn on. Okay. It doesn't mean because you haven't had that turn on that you're not. That you're no longer <laughs> sexual. Right. Okay. So I think that's, that's important. When I think about, you know, we have, Brian and I have a friend who would say that the United States is the second most sexually repressed country. And when I think about being sexually repressed, it's that we can't talk about human sexuality. We can't talk about sexual health. That's a part of human sexuality. We can't talk about sexual health because, oh my God, we're talking about sex parts. And if we talk about sex parts, then we are hurting those innocent people, right, Brian? I mean, yeah. For me, it, so teaching high school, okay, the number one cancer for boys that I teach, the age of the boys that I teach, is testicular cancer. When I ask them, how many of you have had a coach, a parent, an uncle, an older brother, an adult, any, any gender, an adult? talk to you about testicular cancer. No one's hand goes up. No one. Why? We can't talk about testicles. Oh my gosh. All right. Seriously, people are dying because we're not open about mm -hmm. human sexuality. Um, and we've got to get there. We've got to get there. Let me give you an example of biology, Haley, if I can. My older sister who died just before Thanksgiving, her whole life, she was self-conscious self about small breasts. 
And that's biology, right? I mean, the, the biology is involved in the fact that her body did not develop large breasts. And, and so she did not feel um, anywhere near as attractive as she would have if she had been shorter, she felt she was too tall, and if she had had larger breasts. So psychology comes into that too, right? So because the biology doesn't fit her ideal, the psychology that comes up is feelings of inadequacy, right? Well, that's all part of human sexuality too, uh, is when I meet you, Haley, and let's pretend I'm heterosexual, you're heterosexual, well, you are, but so uh, let's say you and I meet and, you know, you're attracted to me, but I don't feel good about my body, right? That's going to impact our ability eventually to be sexual genitally with one another, because I'm holding back thinking, well, you know, one of these days she's going to say, you know, I, I don't really like that about you. So uh, when we so when Carol teaches this class, or I talk to an audience about it, um, it, it takes in, it takes in almost everything. You know, Jesus was sexual, Buddha was sexual. What do we mean by that? Not that they had genital activity, right? But that they had a sense of their bodies, a sense of uh, whether they more represented their fathers or their mothers right? Jesus was fe had a feminine side to him. If he hadn't, his, his message would never have been embraced by the millions of people who have embraced it. And, but I don't think we do a great job talking about it. This morning, Carol and I were talking about the opposition of, uh, of people who are um, conservative to um, transgender issues. And part of the reason is that we didn't do a very good job explaining it, you know, we were passing legislation saying that transgender kids can compete in sports and use the bathroom of their choice. But, and that would send normal people who haven't been told about it, you know, what in the hell are they talking about? You know, what do you mean if, when you go to Harvard, you can say you, the pronoun you want is Z. What is Z? And, and so, you know, we need to back up and do a lot better job helping people understand you know, why does one have a sense of gender that's different than their biology? Is that at all helpful? And I think, you know, I, and I 100% agree with you in terms of, you know, backing up. I think it'd be helpful for all of us to back up and to really get back to the basics in terms of this is not a gay conversation. This is not a transgender conversation. This is a human conversation. Right. We all have this biology makeup. We all have this psychological response to the chemicals in our body. Yeah. Let's talk about how we have that in common. And then from there, we can go into, so now this is how it breaks out here. And this is how it feels over here. Because I do believe that if we could come back to that human approach, it would really lessen the fear. And I, you know, the, for adolescents, they're the, they get it and they get it. I don't think because of education, they get it because the trans thing or the non-binary thing. I just think they are like, everybody's, we're all people. I mean, I, yeah. I feel that certainly there are, you know, bullies and whatnot, but there are so many um, kids who are like, what's, what's the big whoop? you know, more or less. And, and I see that too, a lot with my clients. They're just like, you guys are having your own conversations. Somebody needs to stop and say, where are we? Mm -hmm. and, and I think that when uh, people who are not exposed to difference see it in the context of love, it changes everything mm -hmm. for them. You know, people who come to our house say, you know, I've, you, you are the most loving couple so they're not thinking about sex with Ray and me. They're thinking about these are two men who are in love. And how could one possibly object to that, right? Mm -hmm. how, how, why would you legislate against two people having the love that they share? So I, I think, you know, we, we don't discuss any of this abstractly. We discuss it in the context of the human being who's making, you know, the hero's journey. Right. 
Like let's remove the silos. If you if you think back to when in you know the late 80s, early 90s, when HIV and AIDS first came on, you know, the scene, there was so much misinformation out there, and we had to start from zero. I, I quit a teaching job in 1988 so that I could go out and educate through a health department where I was living in DC because I was being invited in as a, as a woman, you know, a woman could talk about HIV and transmission and et cetera. And, but, and we were going into banks and we were going into schools and we were going into businesses kind of at the ground level and, and people got it. Not everybody, you know, was ever mm -hmm. okay, but, but people at least felt informed. I thought now that's a metropolitan area in DC, but you know, if I'm out in rural Nevada, I don't, I don't know who's educating me, but we did it. Like Brian said, we didn't do that with the trans issue. Um, it, we didn't start in the banks and the schools and the businesses and say, this is what we're talking about. These are what these words mean. Right. right. And now you're playing catch up and who has time to play catch up. We have a pandemic, we have a war, we have, you know, <laughs> we have media. <laughs> right. right. And so I wanted to get both of your speak about this because I'm still, and this might <clears throat> annoy some people, that I don't have an opinion on some of these legislations yet because I'm still learning about them and I'm still trying to sort of find my path in it. So in specifically with the transgender and saying that they can go to any bathroom that they would want to, as a woman who has worked in banking and has been in a very um, alpha male environment, the bathroom was a safe place. The bathroom was a place as a woman, I could just breathe. And I knew I was safe. No man was coming into that bathroom. Mm -hmm. So when we allow the transgender man to come in, my safety immediately feels like it's irrelevant. How do we address that? Well, first you'd begin by saying when the transgender woman comes in, uh, because a transgender man is somebody who was born with a, a, a labia vulva and, and transitioned to being male. What transgender women will say to you, Haley, is I'm just there to pee. I'm just going to go into the stall. I don't feel safe in the men's restroom. I no. understand that, but my question is, how do I feel safe seeing uh -huh. a physically masculine body in the woman's bathroom? What do I do to calm myself down and say I'm safe? Mm -hmm. I think meeting, meeting people who are transgender uh, is the key. That's what, because suddenly, you know, if Kaylee, if you had a really good friend, who was uh, a, a male to female transsexual, really good friend. The next time you're in the women's room and a transgender woman comes in, you see that person in the context of your really good friend mm -hmm. because you, you, you would want your really good friend to be in the same bathroom as you because you know that they would be beaten up if they went into the, the, the men's bathroom. You'd be protective of them. Uh, and and I met through Sex Camp, you know, the book that I wrote, and Carol's in the book as Carol. I met my first transsexual um, at Sex Camp, and, and, you know, we were together for a week. And at the same time, there was a transsexual, there was a cross-dresser, somebody who had a wife, was going to go home in male clothing. But while he was there, he presented himself as female. And... Uh, uh, so, you know, I've, I had to work it through. What's the difference between the two? Um, you know, why doesn't, and the, and the transsexual wore sweatshirts, you know, mm -hmm. she didn't care what she looked like. She didn't try to be a, you know, a girly girl. She was just herself. And I thought, huh. So they gave me a, 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 um, a safe experience that I was able to then use anytime I met somebody who was transgender. It's Does hearing that, it's hearing their story. Mm -hmm. Even yeah. if you don't, you know, even if they're not your best friend, it's hearing their story. How many people has Brian spoken to who and shared his story that they're like, oh, I've heard a story. I'm now, I now understand. For me, Haley, with the 
The bathroom issue is, I think about the person standing outside the men's room and the women's room, deciding, like sweating, which one am I gonna use? They're not barging in there to make you uncomfortable. They have thought about it. They probably have used possibly the man's room, the men's room up until a point when they no longer felt safe going in there because of their transitioning. And now they're in, they go into the women's room. Their choice is not to not to go to the bathroom. Okay. Right. And that's why businesses and schools, when you build a new building now, we have, you know, everything says all gender. All gender. Yeah. And I think that. All gender. You mentioned there, like sharing the story, and I think that story goes both ways. Sharing the story of the transgender person and the woman who now feels like they're irrelevant again. Yeah. Because women have gone through an enormous space to be able to feel safe in the workplace, to have a separate bathroom. (laughs) Um, So I think, you know, being able to share both of those stories as a woman this is why this bathroom is sacred to me tell me about your story Mm -hmm. because you you mentioned sort of that transgender person sweating trying to make the decision about which bathroom to go there's also a woman there sweating she really needs the loo but if she gets up and goes to the loo you know what are the men gonna say if she's like hey i can't like can we delay this call because i've got to go to the bathroom so yeah, I think, I, you know, I, in I, that human sexuality is being able to share the stories and sort of bringing it back to a human thing, to that common denominator of, oh, so we're not that different. Mm-hmm. And, if, and if you were the best swimmer, you know, in your school as a female and, and somebody transitions from male to female and they beat you in swimming, you know, you, you, you need to be able to say, you know, is this really fair? You know, you know, d- don't you have a different bone structure than I do, even I though mean, you biology, don't... right? Yeah. Right. Although all men don't have the same biological. I mean, we're all different from each other. We're all too. different. But I think to that point, which is entirely interesting to me, is when we have these levels of doping <clears throat> for testosterone, where if a person is transitioning, where, and I don't know the answer to this, where are they, their levels of testosterone and how does that measure up to, if this was a woman born as a woman competing as a woman, um, this would be her acceptable test- testosterone. But if this is a transgender or a person transitioning, are their testosterones held at the same level? So testosterone uh, for, or, for people who are transitioning or people who have transitioned, they have, um, from male to female, they, they have testosterone blockers. They don't want testosterone produced in their body right. because that means facial growth or yeah. hair growth. That means things that they just, they want, that's not them. And so their testosterone is blocked and estrogen is often added. Um, Brian? Yes. And, they, and, and I, I don't know if it was the NCAA or the um, what official group uh, has, is changing the rules to say that the person has to be on estrogen for three years, not just one year, three years. Uh, so, so that uh, lowers the natural levels of testosterone to more of a even playing so, field in terms of competing. That's right. That's right. Yeah, you know, and you're not going to take the average male swimmer who who transitions to female. Um, they're not going to win races if there are women who are much better swimmers than they are, right? But Haley, I really think your point is is super, super, super important. And I think maybe it's what um, R.K. Rawlings has gotten herself in hot water about because, you know, she went out there and she started talking about her feelings about, um, about people who transition to female and how it's taking away from the experience women have worked so hard to achieve for themselves, women's spaces, right? Uh, women's liberation, women's thinking, you know, f- and I get that. I, you know, I do, I get it. I, 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 I get the, I understand it. I understand a woman saying, wait a second, you know, my whole life I have fought this battle 
And now suddenly somebody who grew up with male privilege is transitioning into, into my you know, gender and uh, one, they're still exhibiting their male privilege. You know, they, they mm -hmm. call that the, the testosterone rage uh, because they, you know, they, they don't accept that they're no longer entitled, you know, as women are no longer, are, are not entitled. Does that make sense? So Absolutely. yeah, um, I really, I really appreciate you saying that um, and saying, you know, you know, my side has not had a chance to express itself because as soon as we do, we're called, you know, Trumpers. <laughs> well, uh, and I think we're called like bigots. And I mean, there's uh -huh. all sorts of words and it's, again, it's not just, you know, I feel like we are in a society which makes any kind of controversial discussion so heated is that we immediately resort to name calling. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. That's right. But let's, let's broaden the, you know, the swimmer yeah. to... Skylar Baylor, who born female, grew up female, won every race possible as a female swimmer, was accepted, was um, recruited onto the Harvard women's team, transitioned, and the, ma the male coach at Harvard said, he can swim for us. Skylar mm -hmm. Baylor never won any um, awards or races or anything, but boy, did he set a, you know, just Harvard did the right thing. Mm -hmm. They said, we want this athlete, we want this student, and we'll take them, you know? And Skylar taught that, I believe Skylar Baylor taught so many people what it was like to transition and to be, you know, be accepted. I, I actually think that men have an easier time accepting a female to male transsexual than women have uh, with a male to female transsexual. And I, you know, and it's not because women are bigots, but it's because of the, what you just shared, Haley, you know, this struggle to feel safe, to feel empowered. And, you know, how is this, how is this gonna change that, right? Uh, I, I also think there's a lot of sexism in it because uh, men appreciate a biological female stepping up into being a man rather than a man stepping down right. to become right, a woman. Yeah, you know, why would you step down to become right. a woman? Step up, you know, be a man. Yeah. Um, so, but one of the things I I've, I've been doing with uh, on Facebook is asking men my age to talk about the feelings they had when they were in kindergarten through third grade so that the general public, if they read the, the, the testimonies, gets the opportunity to meet someone. I'm not sure, you know, girls have uh, the same sexual feeling. I don't know, Carol, you can, and Haley, you can help, uh, that boys do, but boys sure know at an early age, you know, what TV star they really, really want to watch on TV in first grade, second grade, third grade. And I did, and, and all these people who are writing did, we are, you know, we're comparing the names of the TV stars we all had crushes on. I didn't tell any teacher about that, or I didn't tell my dad about that or my mom about it, because I didn't know what it meant. But, but those- so Brian, Brian, if ahead. I'm in, if, if I'm in those, I think what happens for females is so many, <clears throat> it's a huge generalization, but so many of your physical needs of touching and hugging and whatnot come much easier for females at a young age. I'm thinking eight, nine, 10, 14, right? You have a sleepover and everybody sleeps in the same bed and, and whatever those needs are that I have, it's not a sexual attraction, but it's a, it's a connection, a physical a connection, right? It's a physical connection with another person. I have that satisfied, okay? Boys, you have a sleepover and everybody has to sleep on the floor because you could never put, even in a king bed, two boys. Although that's uh, changing. I you know, hope young, so. I hope yeah, so. Young, I, there's a lot of information out now about how younger men are much less uptight 
about getting sharing a bed and watching a movie together. It's, and, it, it's, at a boarding school, certainly. I mean, one of the things that um, people say, what sets my school apart from other boarding schools? And I'm always like, our boys are so nice. Like they, <laughs> they're big huggers and they're big, like they are, they're, I don't want to say they're criers, but they're, they emote and they hug and they, you know, they love their buddies. And it's just, it's so refreshing to see. Mm -hmm. So I, I do agree with you, Brian, but I just, I, you know, I, I, so I feel like for, for so many people, it's natural for females to connect. I think that's a good word, connect with other human beings, attraction or not, um, that men necessarily don't necessarily get. Many well, men don't get. women are also, I mean, two, two girls can hold hands. Right. And no one, no one is going to tell them to stop doing that. Right. No one. Even even you, all the way up to you know the friendships of sex in the city. I mean, these women walking down the street arm in right. arm. The, the culture in the U.S. does not allow that for boys. Right. At a certain point, let go of his hand. Mm -hmm. Right, that's not the way and boys. It's an amazing point there, Brian. Because if we take this to human sexuality thing. When two girls hold hands, it doesn't mean that both of them are lesbian or one of them is lesbian. That's so right. when two boys are holding hands, same age, say we have like two six-year-old girls holding hands and swinging and skipping down the street, two six-year-old boys doing the same thing still doesn't mean at that age no. that they've decided I'm holding your hand because I'm attracted to you in a different way. I, I agree with you. There's an affection there. Affection, there's, a difference, yeah. there's a difference between uh, the affection that you know you have for your best friend and holding hands or knocking their knee, you know, when you're sitting next to them, you know, stuff that may not touching their shoe um, is is an expression of friendship, not not erotic. I need to, I want to, you know, have right. sex. With but that's different than, and I, uh, the feelings that, that I had when I would see these men was electrifying. And I've never had a feeling like that to compare it to. It was disorienting, right? And, and so that disorienting feeling continued, continued, continued until Finally, I was able to give it a name, what, what it was, because I started to understand it. But it wasn't about me wanting the rifleman to be my best friend and hold my hand. It was me wanting to get in bed with the rifleman, not to have sex as I wasn't thinking that yet, but to be held right by this person. Um, but I had his body in mind when I was being held. I didn't have my body in mind, you know, in terms of what my body would do or or react, but being close to his body. And that, I remember those feelings, you know, way back uh, when I was little. And, and girls, you know, with some, some women, Carol is somebody who, who identifies as lesbian, but when we first met, she was heterosexually identified and married, right? Mm -hmm. So I can't speak to the experiences or feelings of little girls but there are little girls who knew from age five that they were mm -hmm. attracted to other girls, not well, just friendship. Yeah, but. and I think it reminds me of this. I used to work in daycares when I was in college and the kids that I looked after were two, but then in the afternoon, sort of when they started rolling off the other teachers, you'd combine like kids of different, like the zero to four year olds would all be together until their parents came. And there were definitely some kids in there that seemed to be more um, fired up by being able to, like some of the little girls definitely wanted to play with little boys and they were four. Mm -hmm. And that some of the other little girls just wanted to hang out with little girls and play dolls. Mm -hmm. So when we look at human sexuality, is there that difference in some children where they possibly develop sooner or I guess the better word is just differently in terms of being able to act or become aware of that electrifying feeling of 
this person makes me feel electric versus I'm just having an affectionate fun round time with my girls. Right. And we could, uh, Carol, you, you answer that. Go ahead. Well, yeah, I, cause I'm feeling like I, I would, I, where do I feel comfortable? Okay. Yeah. I, I come to your after school program and I feel comfortable as a female going over to the dress up corner and hanging out with whoever is there. Okay. It's the dress up corner. That's really right. drawing me in and the, the like-minded people who come regardless of gender, we're going to have fun because it's the dress up corner. Yeah. Now, you know, I, do I have a favorite person there? Yes. But I, and do I identify them at four years old as male and female? Yes. But it's not at all, I don't believe for the vast majority that it's at all what we would consider an erotic turn on. Brian uses the word electric. I don't, that's not a word that comes to my mind, um, you know, as a child. You have best friends, but yeah. it's, not an, it's not an electric. Yeah, this is, Carol, if I was watching a program, uh, and it was my favorite guy, yeah. you know, and I just, my, my, I, it's like our dog Lincoln, you know, if he's got something on his mind, he cannot hear you, you know, yeah. you get upset thinking, I'm so good to you. Why don't you do what I tell you? It's because he has that iguana on his mind and he can't get up. Right. So that's what would happen to me. I, right. you know, I'd be watching and I'd hear mom say, Brian, come on upstairs and take out the garbage. And I would have this like panic, panic feeling. No, no. And the voice would say, you know, you're a good boy. Do what your mom says. No, I have to watch him. I have to be here. I can't leave it. So it's a, it, I don't know if you've ever had that experience as a first, yeah. second, third grader, mm -hmm. but I sure did. And it wasn't because and, and you know what, when you talked about the dress up corner and you two both lit up, you know, Haley, you lit up when she said the dress up corner. I could stand there in the room and look over at what the boys were doing and see that they were not having as much fun as the girls were. The girls were laughing and, you know, carrying. so I as a kid might want to just go where the people are having more fun, right? Mm -hmm as a little boy who hasn't yet been scolded for, you know, being around girls, uh, because at that age, girls have more fun, at least in my book, they do, than pushing people down on the ground. <laughs> so, you know, going to that sort of, okay, what's happening now in the schools? And Carol, you mentioned that with the, children, the teens that you're um, fortunate to be around, you see that a lot of them are just like, yeah, okay. What's the, you know, what's the big conversation about? They're fine. In the schools today, how much are we aware of children feeling safe enough to go to the fun corner? That's a great question. And I haven't been in I haven't been in elementary age schools in a long, long, long time. So my hope would be that, you know, and I've always been in private schools, Haley, so I know it's mm -hmm. different. It's not, you know, we have, we can make every, when we bring a kid in, we pretty much guarantee their safety. I mean, parents are paying a lot of money to have their child there and, and we have to keep their child safe and that's emotional safety, physical safety. So if, if you call the admissions office and you say, I have a, my child is transitioning or my child has transitioned, can Holderness create a safe space for that person? Up until this past year, we haven't been able to say yes, only because we weren't ready and we mm -hmm. didn't want to bring in a student right. for whom we couldn't guarantee that safeness. So safety, excuse me. So um <clears throat> I, I feel, I, I, I can't speak for the younger, the younger group. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I just hope, I hope that it's better for them. But, you know, the legislation that's out there, I think about how many great books, children's books are going to be lost um, to be read to kids because of the legislation. Well, what's, you know, their parents what's gay? can always read it. 
the parents can always read it. Yes. The parents yes. can always read those books. But, right. But the kid, but, let's say the kid brings Brian's book in for show and tell. Okay. Parents don't even really know that he brought it in. Um, but he loves that book and his mom's read it to him and, and he wants the teacher to see it. And the teacher's like her reaction or his reaction is going to be fear. Like, yeah, can't have that book in my classroom. I'm sorry, but so I'll be fired. I'll what? be fired. Right. Yeah. I'll be fired but if you bring think, that book in my classroom. And I, you know, I do where I am with this legislation of coming, coming down. I think it's more of a human rights atrocity than just a gay atrocity because you're taking away freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. And again, I feel like we need to bring that conversation all the way back to, this isn't just about the word gay, this is about your freedom to say the word gay. Mm -hmm. It affects every person, every creed, every religion, everybody to not be able to say that word. Why aren't we worried about that? I, and that's where I think the courts might get involved, Haley. Yeah. I would love to believe, uh, you know, the legislation talks about parents are the primary educators of their children. Well, they are in that if they don't talk about sex, the message is the education the kid is getting is that you can't talk about it. And I don't think parents have the time to sit down with their children and with Carol talking earlier about, you know, we got a war going on, we got coronavirus, we got this, that. Yeah, I mean, this is a socioeconomic issue. Right. So, uh, and parents, nobody talked to them, Brian. Nobody talked to the parents. So, right. That's right. Yeah. So, where do the parents, the parents have no background, they don't have a curriculum, they don't have a lesson plan, they don't have anything or even role modeling from their, their parents as to how to have the discussion. And when you have the discussion, right, is it a one-time thing that you discuss, it, you know, well, the penis is inserted into the vagina and, uh, and that's it. I, you know, I'll often ask an audience, Haley, how many of you feel that you got a good sex education from your parents? And everyone laughs, but three hands will go up. Mm -hmm. And I'll say, did the sex education include any information about homosexuality and they'll say no. And I said, well, then it wasn't a good sex education <laughs> because they, they're assuming you're straight, right? And they're assuming you're gonna get married and that that's, they're assuming for you what your sexuality is. It's, that wasn't very good sex ed. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think we're still in that cycle of assuming. <laughs> yeah. We're all really good at, good at like class A assumers. Yeah. So, but, but you asked that same audience, Brian, how many of your, like when I asked teenagers, how many of you, your parents, how many of you know exactly what your parents think about you using drugs or alcohol or not wearing a seatbelt or all of those other stay safe, right? Stay, no. stay healthy. I want what's best for you. All parents have those conversations, but when it comes to human sexuality, I can't do it as a parent, you know, it's well, just wear a condom you'll get you'll hear a parent say whatever you if, do if you have a son if you have a daughter don't go near a boy right you can't trust boys that's the message that's and boys are dangerous right. they will they only want one thing and they will hurt. right yeah and what an bully. insult what an insult to boys right adolescent boys have brains they have ability to not want something it's just um, it's, yeah, and I think, you know, for me, bringing this from a spiritual perspective, this is the separation. You know, we are so conformed into being told who we are, what we are, which is all about these assumptions, that when you're in that space, you don't even know how to ask the question, who am I, because you're told who you are. You're told that this is what a good relationship is. You're told that this is what a good life looks like. This is what success looks like. This is what happiness looks like. Anything other than that, well, you suck. <laughs> You're failing. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And, so, and that's what's scary about uh, preventing a teacher from talking about anything other than one you know, possible way to be sexual. Or, or, be, or be a family, Brian. 
Yeah, yeah, you mentioned a really good word there, Carol, which is one model. And I, you know, I very much hope, you know, sort of bring this into where we are today, that we're getting to that breaking point of the one model. And I think we're starting to see this clearly from what you're speaking of in the school that you're at, Carol, this diversity that encourages a diversity of mindset mm -hmm. and allows people to flourish in understanding their uniqueness and how interconnected that is into the whole. So one can only hope, and I think from all of our experiences, talking to the younger people that are coming up today, they do have a little bit more of that diversity of mindset. And, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of the younger people that I speak to today, and I'm fortunate enough to see some kids, it's just like, they're like looking at me going like, why are you so, like, this isn't even our world. You're talking about stuff that is your world, not our world. Mm -hmm. And it's such a clear reminder to me to be like, Hey, where's your biasy? Well, and yeah, if you right. take a, yeah. if you take a look at them, at what beyond the parent and beyond the teacher, what is the culture teaching them? You know, what is SpongeBob? You know, what is this name? SpongeBob SquarePants. SquarePants. <laughs> what what message is he? You know, the 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 Disney um, animated cartoon Mulan. That was the first time there was a female warrior, and it was right. wonderful for young girls to be able to see that they can be warriors, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, there there was this walkout at Disney over the Disney's lack of response to the Florida legislation, and you know, um, they they made a pledge that they're going to do a better job representing all families in their animation and storylines, which is great because that's where kids see stuff mm -hmm. and they talk about it together, not with and their parents. And that I think is the culture that we may be underestimating. I uh -huh. feel like the kids that are coming through today have a much stronger sense of self that I think is not coming from the outside. It's coming from them chatting to each other and having mm -hmm. And openness, I don't know if the openness comes in every generation doing a slightly better job than the previous generation, or if it's just finally our DNA is evolving to like, <laughs> hey, be more open. But I think the culture in these children connecting without the outside is powerful. And there's something, I feel like that there's something in that human connection between their kids where they're just like, dude, you're fun. I'm good having fun. And, and Haley, I think going, you know, you, you laughed a little bit when you said DNA, but I think you and I agree that um, all of this spiritual movement that we see going on around the world is changing the, 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 the messages that are going to get related in the birth of the next generation. Yeah, and I think- We're part of the evolution. That, yeah, I mean, I'm part of a generation that has- stepped up into the mental health like no other generation before mm -hmm. that's benefited the dna that we may not be seeing now but in like 20 for sure. 30 years for sure that dna will show so you know these children being born now they're being born with dna that hopefully is a little bit more healed more complete mm -hmm. on the open side than the biasy fear side or let I and I think of it, I guess my language would be that they're less scripted. Mm, like I feel yeah. like we we were brought up and here is the script, right? And we had this record in our brain and it, the script went round and round and round with a needle. And how so the you know, how do you break that script that you were given, that record you were given that played over and over and over again? I think there's a maybe babies are born with a few different scripts now that I think so. And I think. You know, I've always been a firm believer that parents should be the ultimate guardians of children. They shouldn't push mm -hmm. that off onto teachers. And perhaps this is the move now for parents to become more involved in their children. I know that there are some parents involved, but the vast amount very much rely on teachers to raise their children. And in, a lot of, in all areas, right? Yeah. Well, and I think Hopefully now the this is a push where parents are like, well, I guess I'm going to have to do some of this education myself. Mm -hmm. Well, and part of it, you know, we, you know, we're, we're three white people talking about um, this issue when, and, and many racial minorities 
they can't, they don't have time. They, you know, they're single moms. They've got all these kids. They're working three jobs to pay the rent and, and put food on the table. They, you know, t telling them, okay, you know, you're the primary sex educators of their kids. Uh, I think is overwhelming for them. That And Haley, that's the people I really agree. Well, and I think, yeah, I mean, we mentioned to earlier, there was a much bigger socioeconomic issue to this because I don't yeah. think it's just the, you know, lower income parents that struggle with this. I think it's the high income too. Mm -hmm. They're struggling and to keep up, like to keep the house together. So there's, you know, I'm not in a position to speak. I can speak a tiny bit to the socioeconomic, but again, I think it's, it's an interesting discussion. And I think hopefully that if people are hearing this, they're at least take it and just think about it themselves and be like, hmm. And what religion are you? I mean, our last guest was a, Jehovah Witness, where as adults, if you were out with a woman, you had to have an escort and, you know, and you were only allowed to date other Jehovah Witnesses. Uh, it's a great interview that, that last one Haley and I had with Dan, but uh, so beyond socioeconomic, what is, what is the religion of the parents when we're asking them to talk to their children mm -hmm. about the full, the full spectrum of human sexuality? I think we can even go back to the whole idea of colonialization. Who are you to tell a person of another religion? This is what you should talk to about your kid. That, right, right. Um, Haley, uh, you were you were talking and in, and in, in Carol too about uh, break that, that there's another generation that doesn't relate to the world that we that you know. Um, Haley and I talk a lot with guest Carol about the hero's journey. I don't know how much time we have, Haley, but we have four minutes. <laughs> okay. Well, I personally think that uh, kids uh, who, who who leave that record that Carol talked about, that's the hero's journey. You know, to say, I'm sorry, mom and dad. I'm sorry, but the record doesn't work for me anymore. And these people, in general, humans, are embarking on that journey far, far earlier than previous generations. Mm -hmm. Yep which is exciting to me. And is, very hopeful. <laughs> yeah, very hopeful and exciting. Yeah. Indeed. Well, Carol, thank you so much for joining oh, us. It's like the, the, the hour flew day. by. The hour Wasn't it fun, by. Carol? I told it you it'd be fun. It was great. It was great fun, Brian. Yeah. I could Good. talk about this all day, but I've got to run to go and okay. learn about another socioeconomic situation. <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet you, you, Haley. Lots of love, love you, to you all, and we'll speak soon. Okay, bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.